What is art? And what is its value? Does art have the importance now customarily attributed to it? If so, why? In this chapter, I want to sharpen these fundamental questions and show how a skeptical line of thought brings a sense of urgency to them. Tolstoy questioned the value of individual works of art, but he never questioned the value of art itself. Some thinkers have gone much further and doubted that art has any special value. We will look at one such argument in this chapter, an argument based on a modern philosophy of value. To some people, it may seem almost incoherent to seriously question the value of art. One reason for this response has to do with language. The very words we use disguise the fact that there could be a genuine doubt that it is valuable. The special vocabulary reserved for art is heavily value-laden. The word art itself is often used to express approval and positive value, as in, the D-Day invasion was a work of art, or there is an art to taking organized lecture notes. This use of the word art has a valuative implication. It commits the speaker to approving of the object or activity in question. Clearly, in this book, we have been using art in a different sense, descriptive sense in which it simply refers to the large body of artifacts that society labels art or works of art. In this sense, it is not self-contradictory to ask whether art has any value. Other crucial words used in discourse about the arts are also value-laden. For example, masterpiece and genius. The great artists are geniuses and their works are masterpiece. How can one question the value of such works? Why shouldn't such work be preserved in museums and performed in concert halls? Don't such works, in fact, constitute for us the very paradigm of cultural achievement? Yet, the use of such terms only reminds us again that art has a very high status and that some artworks are considered to be greater than other artworks. It does not explain what value art in general has. Another reason why one could be puzzled by any attempt to question the value of art comes from the common failure to distinguish historical value from aesthetic value. Historical value derives from those properties that make an artifact important from a historical point of view, whereas by aesthetic value, I mean the value, whatever it is, that artworks have in themselves. An artifact can be historically interesting for many reasons. Works of art can tell scholars much about the society in which they were produced. A painting, for example, can tell us what clothing people wore, how they played musical instruments, how they fought, what they believed, how servants related to their masters, and so forth. A work of art may also have historical interest from the point of view of the history of art. There are at least three different ways in which works can acquire art historical interest. These ways correspond to three categories of artworks. The first is work that achieved fame in its own time, that is, an artwork gains art historical interest because it was very popular in its own time. An example is Leonardo's Mona Lisa, 1503. Painting, many people look at because it has always seemed important. A scholar of the painting tells us that when it was still in Leonardo's Florence, and very probably 
not yet finished. She was already inspiring imitation. By the middle of the 16th century, she was being pronounced divine rather than human in its perfection. By the middle of the 19th century, it was a goal for pilgrimages. Second is work that has exerted influence. That is, a work may have art historical interest because it had a discernible impact on subsequent artists. Examples are Beethoven's symphonies, the ninth and last completed in 1824, which dominated the thinking of most 19th century composers. The third source of art historical interest lies in the originality of work. The revolutionary verbal experiments of the early 20th century writers James Joyce and Gertrude Stein are examples. Each of these attributes of an artwork is a fact about it that gives it a scholarly interest and thus a historical importance that justifies preserving and studying such work. Often these traits go together. Because work is famous or original, it is influential. Nonetheless, it is possible for a particular work of art to have any one of these attributes without having the others, and although unlikely for a work to have all of these attributes and not have what I am defining as aesthetic value, art historical value need not track with aesthetic value. It would be possible, that is, for artwork to be popular or influential for the wrong reasons. Much of the so-called academic painting of the 19th century, for example, which was both popular and influential, is now thought to be merely of historical interest. Confusing a work's historical popularity with its aesthetic value commonly leads to a false estimation of the work's value. Surely the Mona Lisa, for example, is no greater than hundreds of other paintings by Leonardo and his contemporaries, yet it is far more famous than any other visual artwork. Conversely, artwork that was not appreciated in its own time might now seem to have the highest possible aesthetic value. The same point obviously applies to influence and even to originality. The composers of the Mannheim court in Germany literally invented the symphony in the 1760s. Yet, although their symphonies are still played today, contemporary listeners do not consider them very significant. Similarly, the first true opera, Daphne, 1597, is historically important only because it was the first of its kind, but the first great opera, the first opera that still speaks to audiences today, is Monteverdi's Orfeo, 1607. The distinction between aesthetic value and historical value is particularly clear in the case of the composer Johann Sebastian Bach, 1685-1750. Bach is usually considered one of the three great composers of all time, yet in his lifetime he worked in relative obscurity for a variety of church and court patrons. His work was thought old-fashioned, even to his contemporaries, and rapidly fell out of favor after his death. His work was neither popular nor influential, nor was it particularly original. Bach pioneered no new musical forms, for example. All he had was incredible musical insight and genius, so much so that it took almost a century for audiences to begin to appreciate the depth, complexity, and beauty of his music. I want to emphasize that I am using the expression 
aesthetic value in a special way. Aesthetic value is whatever value or values come from normal appreciation of a work of art. That is, from listening to music, reading a novel, looking at a painting, watching a play, and so forth. In contrast to historical importance, which derives from facts about an artwork, aesthetic value is founded on the direct experience of the work of art. Note that I have not tried to analyze appreciation, nor have I implied that one can properly respond to an artwork without having a great deal of historical knowledge about it. My aim has been limited to contrasting the value that fundamentally justifies art, what I have dubbed its aesthetic value. From a common reason for supposing that art is valuable, namely its historical importance. It is especially important to avoid confusing aesthetic value with historical importance because the distinction is commonly blurred in the study of art history. Sometimes the two values are almost exquisitely intertwined, as is this praise of poetry of Petrarch, 1304-1374, and Boccaccio, 1313-1375, by the great Renaissance scholar Jacob Burkhart. We shall find in them the earliest complete expression of modern European feeling. The question, be it remembered, is not to know whether eminent men of other nations did not feel so deeply and so nobly, but who were the first to give documentary proof of the widest knowledge of the movements of the human heart. Burkhart seems to be praising the Italian poets for their originality because they were the first to express a modern mentality, but closer reading suggests that he assumes that what they express, knowledge of the workings of the human heart, is profound and universally relevant. To ask whether art has an important or unique type of value is to ask whether the aesthetic value of works of art is important or unique. There is no doubt that many works of art have great historical value in the sense that they are important in the history of art in the ways delineated above, but such value must take second place to aesthetic value. The arts are not important because their history is important. Rather, their history is especially important because they are. Artworks of the past are relevant and alive for spectators today just as they were for spectators in their own time. We are still deeply moved and enlightened by the plays, operas, poems, and so forth of past centuries. To be sure, historical value is value, but that alone cannot account for the importance placed on art, nor would it adequately answer Tolstoy's challenge. Who can believe that Beethoven's symphonies are repeatedly performed because the audience is primarily interested in their historical importance, or that we could justify the great expense of so many live performances merely on historical grounds. Given the great familiarity of the music and availability of accurate recordings. Our experience of art is largely an experience of art of the past. This is true even if what we like are works of the more recent past, such as jazz records or Hitchcock movies. This fact raises a host of other questions concerning what spectators today get out of art from the past. Do we get the same value? Do we even 
experience the art in the same way as its original audience did. A work of art may have been valued in its own time, not for its aesthetic value, but for other reasons. For instance, many art forms were thought of in their own times, principally as having a practical, functional value. Their importance derived in large measure from the useful functions they serve. Now that these works no longer fulfill their original function, you must ask, do we correctly understand the works as they were intended? And have we really discovered an aesthetic value that replaces the lost functional value? This functional value is exemplified in one of the greatest periods of painting, the Middle Renaissance. A noteworthy piece of this period, Giotto's Kiss of Judas, as Michael Baxenthal reminds us, most 15th century pictures are religious pictures. The religious function of these pictures was to excite and instruct spectators about the biblical stories. For the viewer, it amounts to using pictures as respectively lucid, vivid, and readily accessible stimuli to meditation on the Bible and the lives of the saints. The sense of sight was used as a powerful and precise replacement for the inadequate and often inaccessible medium of words. For a spectator of the period, the best paintings were those that most effectively heighten the ability to meditate on Christian themes. Today, most viewers of paintings by such great masters as Giotto, Fra Angelico, or Piero della Francesca do not have this aim at all. Are any contemporary spectators able to find aesthetic value in works that were meant to be appreciated in a different way? It seems so. Indeed, the fact that a work of art has strongly and broadly appealed to spectators over a substantial period of time is evidence that a work has great aesthetic appeal. Consider, for example, Box, St. Matthew Passion, 1727. This work for chorus, solo voices, and orchestra has been aptly described as one of the transcendent monuments of Christian musical art. The content of Bach's Passion is, of course, the Gospel of St. Matthew, yet the work appeals as strongly to non-religious listeners as to religious listeners, and as strongly to listeners today as to listeners in Bach's time. This suggests that the work's attraction comes not from its original liturgical function, but from its powerful musical expression. In sum, we have distinguished three broad sorts of value a work of art may be thought to have, historical, functional, and aesthetic value. But the special value that art is assumed to have can be neither historical value nor functional value. Functional value can in some cases explain why art was worth producing. Historical value can account for why art is worth preserving, but only aesthetic value can account for why it is ultimately important. Fortunately, traditional theories of art have given accounts of aesthetic value. By investigating these theories, philosophy of art ought to be able to illuminate the nature of aesthetic value. The aesthetic value of a book is different from its economic value, and is differently determined as is its weight in pounds, its utility as a doorstop, its elevating or edifying life-enhancing properties, its gallery of truths, 
new truths, known truths, believed truths, important truths, alleged truths, trivial truths, absolute truths, coming truths, plain, unvarnished truths. William Gass. Skepticism about aesthetic value. Can we identify the nature of aesthetic value? There is a skeptical position that claims that art has no special value. That, in fact, there is no special aesthetic value. Jeremy Bentham, 1748-1832, the great English philosopher, is reputed to have put it this way. Prejudice aside, the game of pushpin is of equal value with the arts and sciences of music and poetry. Bentham's famous remark argues that the high status of such arts as poetry is based on sheer prejudice for which there is no objective basis. Poetry is no better than the children's game of pushpin. Fundamentally, it is no different just appeals to a different group of participants. As the contemporary American philosopher Hilary Putnam comments, What makes this so shocking to the modern reader is how deeply it conflicts with our current cultural values. The arts have been exalted by us to a place higher than they occupied in Plato's day or in the Middle Ages. For a certain sort of educated person, art today is a religion, i.e., the closest thing to salvation available. Bentham's position is important because it is founded on an influential theory of value. Bentham was one of the originators of utilitarianism, a moral theory that holds that action is right, which produces the greatest net sum of happiness. Since Bentham views happiness as compounded of pleasures, he holds that whatever gives pleasure is valuable to that extent. So there is a value to art beyond its historical and functional value, namely the pleasure it gives members of the audience. But there is no special value that gives art more importance than other pleasurable activities. All one can say, objectively, is that one person enjoys reading a poem, whereas another person enjoys reading the sports pages of a newspaper. Prejudice aside, one activity is as good, that is, as valuable, as the other. Thus, the sports page is as valuable as any poem. Many people think of the arts in terms that unintentionally support Bentham's shocking evaluation. Mary McCarthy's description of Venetian painting is quite typical. Venice's most wonderful invention, that of the easel painting, was designed solely for pleasure. Painting up to Giorgione had a utility basis the glorification of God and the saints, the glorification of the state, the glorification of the individual for portrait. Giorgione was the first to create canvases that had no purpose beyond sheer enjoyment, the production of agreeable moods, as Berenson puts it. Giorgione's pastoral concert one of the earliest easel paintings is illustrated in plate one. This is an insightful description of an important change in attitude toward painting that occurred during this period. But as an account of the aesthetic value of painting from this or any other period, it falls right into Bentham's trap. It is likely that no serious lover of painting would base the aesthetic value on sheer pleasure, but what can be put in its place? 
Interestingly, Bernard Branson, a famous connoisseur of Renaissance painting, gives an account of art different from that attributed to him by McCarthy. All the arts are compounded of ideated sensations, no matter through what medium conveyed, provided they are communicated in such wise as to produce a direct effect of life enhancement. The question then is what in a given art produces life enhancement, and the answer for each art will be as different as its medium. Unfortunately, Branson never develops his vague concept of life enhancement. It seems to be the pious hope that art ought to have an important positive value on the spectator. Bentham's position, however, is not based simply on an oversight or on an overstatement of the sort McCarthy makes, and it cannot be overturned by pious hopes. Bentham expresses the view that there is no life-enhancing effect except pleasure. Bentham's challenge can be formulated as the following inference. 1. If the value of the arts lies solely in the pleasure they give, then poetry is intrinsically no better than pushpin. 2. There is no value to the arts except pleasure. 3. Hence, poetry is intrinsically no better than pushpin. Premise 2 follows from the hedonistic view that pleasure and pain are the only intrinsic values in the world. Bentham's eminent follower in the 19th century, John Stuart Mill, tried to develop a more sophisticated utilitarianism in which he distinguished higher from lower pleasures by distinguishing among pleasures, one can hope to escape Bentham's reasoning. But it is essential to argue that some pleasures are intrinsically better than others. And this Mill does. He tries to argue that the higher pleasures of poetry count for more than the pleasure of pushpin. Thus, Mill accepts premise 2, but rejects premise 1, and so Bentham's challenge collapses. Mill's position is difficult to defend, however. It is far more common to reject premise 2, and thus to agree merely that if the value of art resided solely in pleasure, it would be difficult to elevate the arts above other enjoyments. In response to premise two, many defenders of the arts would contend that the arts have meaning or truth that cannot be captured or expressed any other way. Hilary Putnam claims, We have a reason for preferring poetry to pushpin, and that reason lies in the felt experience of great poetry and of the after effects of great poetry, the enlargement of the imagination and the sensibility through the enlargement of our repertoire of images and metaphors, and the integration of poetic images and metaphors with mundane perceptions and attitudes that takes place when a poem has lived in us for a number of years. This is an attractive suggestion. It replaces Bentham's premise that art only gives pleasure with the claim that art enlarges our capacity to experience the world. This claim is similar to the explanation that 
D.W. Griffith, the pioneering American film director, gave to his work. The task I am trying to achieve is to make you see. Putnam's defense must assume both that there is some sort of truth in art and the way that it alters us and that it doesn't exist in other activities. Otherwise, Benthamites could reply that it is possible to appeal to our prejudices about the value of the activities we prefer. Someone who preferred football to poetry, for example, could put his defense of football in exactly the same terms as Putnam's. He could appeal to the enlargement of perception and feeling caused by great football games, and his defense might seem plausible to those who enjoy football but find poetry meaningless. To evaluate defenses of art such as Putnam's adequately, we need to explore the plausibility of the claim that art does really expand the spectator and that it does so in ways that are unique and superior to non-art methods of expanding people. To counter Bentham's skepticism, we must develop a plausible theory of art that identifies the unique and positive way in which art alters our experience. Putnam's defense depends on a mimetic theory of art, which contends that the basic function of art is to represent the world. Presupposing such a view, Putnam is able to suggest that poetry represents the world in a way that is deep, unique, and truthful. He can argue that experience of the world through poetry, through the poet's sensibilities increases and alters our perception. The mimetic theory of art, however, has an important weakness. It is hard pressed to account for the existence of the non-representational arts, such as instrumental music and abstract visual arts. Yet these art forms are very highly regarded Many of the greatest works of art of the last three centuries have been musical works. For example, the symphonies of Beethoven, the keyboard works of Bach, without words or narrative, with nothing represented. What is the meaning or truth of such works? How could a defense like Putnam's be given for purely instrumental music? Such works of art pose a general challenge to philosophy of art. Are we to fall back on a Bentham-like position in the case of music and abstract art? Holding that such art has no value outside of the sensory pleasures it causes. For most people, this would be an outrageous partition of the arts. The usual view of the status of music, for example, is quite the opposite. The 19th century aesthetician Walter Pater formulated this view in a famous saying, all art aspires towards the condition of music. Music may indeed be the highest art of all, this is right, we cannot ignore the need to find an account of the aesthetic value of music, as well as of the other non-representational arts. There appear to be three options. First, we can try to find a way to extend the mimetic theory to abstract art showing how even such art has a representational content. Second, we can retain the mimetic theory for representational art, but develop a different theory for non-representational art. Third, we can give up the mimetic theory 
and with it, the fences are, are similar to Putnam's, and instead try to find an overarching theory of art that applies to all forms of art and accounts for its aesthetic value in a uniform way. There is much to be said for each option. The first option appeals to those who feel that artworks must always represent something and that the mimetic theory of art is therefore the true account of art. The second option appeals to those who believe that the arts are a mixed bag and that more than one theory may be required to account for the nature and value of different arts. The third option, of course, chosen by proponents of theories of art that compete with the mimetic theory, such as formalist and expression theories of art. We can make the final evaluation of these options only after we consider the major theories of art. Let's sum up this chapter. We have discovered that a central task of philosophy of art is to find a theory of art that accounts for its aesthetic value. We considered one simple but powerful skeptical view that denies the existence of a special aesthetic value over and above people's subjective preference. This skeptical challenge suggests that an adequate theory of art must be able to explain what is valuable about the arts, including non-representational arts, beyond the pleasure they yield to the spectator. A successful theory of art must do even more. It must show not just that art has some aesthetic value, but that art is deep and profound, that its value is as high as anything that human culture produces.